I just know that there's difficulty in preaching about this subject. And I think I know why. There's some ways we can experience grace. If we have any sensitivity and, and any insights and understanding of our need of, of the gospel and the forgiveness of God, we, we can experience some things along this line. And, and we can see faith working in our lives and the lives of others. I can see Jerry Jones make changes over the years as, as there's greater and greater faith developed in his heart and in his life, and I'm sure he can see some in mine. And, and we can experience something of the great power of God as we feebly reach out to trust one of his promises and we see God fulfill that promise and finally after a number of years we no longer have to say, well, I, I think there's a God or I believe there's a God. We can say, I know there's a God. I've been trying his promises and he's kept every one of them and I know his word is true. But I'm not sure we can say, you know, some of these things about heaven. We've never been there. Tonight, let's try it. We're a little like the little boy who went to the seashore and returned home and told the teacher, Teacher, I, I went to the ocean this summer and I, I know all about the ocean. Well, the good teacher knew that he didn't know all about the ocean, that the greatest oceanographers know very little about it. And yet she encouraged him. She knew that he knew more than he did. He'd walked along the seashore and the restless action of the waves had tossed up a few pebbles and shells. And he'd waited in the shallows and he'd picked up those mementos and brought them home. And, and he knew a little bit more. And so this evening, let's walk around as little children. The ocean of God's love. Let's let the Holy Spirit of God, operating through the Word of God, take us by the hand and reveal to us a few things about that blessed land. We talk about heaven, the home of the soul. I just start with the topic, and we talk about heaven, the home of the soul. And, and when we do, I, I think sometimes we leave a wrong impression, especially with young people and teenagers. I can recall as a teenager thinking, heaven, the home of the soul. That's where my spirit goes, and, you know, I couldn't get too excited about that some way. And I remember one of the first times I was preaching about eternity and about recognition in heaven and things like that, a preaching brother came up and rebuked me and he said, young man, you're mistaken. And I said, how's that? And he said, well, we won't know one another in heaven. And he said, we'll just be, you know, over there and, and no one will know one another. Well, I don't believe the Bible teaches that at all. And, and I said, well, what will it be like over there? And he said, well, we'll just be disembodied spirits. And if I happen to float by my wife on the ethereal air of that eternal city that she'll not know me and I'll not know her, well, that doesn't appeal to me much in the first place. And in the second place, it's false doctrine. The Bible doesn't teach it. Bible teaches that we'll have some bodies over there in John 5, 28 and 29. The Bible says, Marvel not at this, for all that are in their graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those that have done good into the resurrection of life, something's going to come out of that grave and it's going to be yonder in eternity. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 talks about being clothed upon with his house, which is from heaven. And he doesn't want to be naked. That is a disembodied spirit, but he wants this house that God has for him eternal in the heavens. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, don't be afraid of those that kill the body but cannot harm the soul, but fear him which is able to destroy soul and body in hell. And so something will come out of the grave. It'll not be the old uh, decaying uh, body that we put there, the old mortal body subject to decay, but it'll be a glorified, resurrected spiritual body, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. It'll be like the body of our Lord Jesus, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. John said, It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, that's the very first thing I wanted to make. That's by way of of commenting upon the subject this evening. We might say that heaven is the final home of the redeemed of all the ages. But now then we need to read a text this evening, and, and I'd like to read one of my favorite passages. If you have your testament and can it turn to John chapter 14, we will read just there and then begin from that point. I think this is one of the loveliest promises and one of the most meaningful passages in all the Word of God. I used to think only elderly people thought about heaven, but I, I'm not sure now. I'm not even sure that those who are older think as much about it as they did when they were younger. And I once thought when I've preached for 40 years and made a lot of sacrifices that I'll be able to preach better about heaven. But I don't think that I improve with the passing years. Somehow I think this has a tremendous appeal to young people. A teenager heard that I was going to speak about heaven over here. And he said, Brother Carl, that's great. Oh, he said, I know you're so excited about that. And I thought, yeah, you never have tried to preach on it either. And he said, why, that's, that's just the greatest. And I said, well, why do you say that? I was interested. He said, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what it's all about? Well, he said, we young people feel that, that heaven is that bottom line. And I didn't know what he meant by that, but I learned later that he was, had a double major in Bible and business. And I suppose he's talking about the fact that that bottom line is that balance account down there. Well, he said, that's what it's all about. Heaven is the bottom line. And then I got to thinking as I drove over here the other day that, that, that he's expressing something. Young people are idealistic. And they, they want to think that there's something far better and above and beyond anything that we know here. 
And I think that's why they're so interested in heaven. Well, in John chapter 14, we find the beautiful promise of Jesus. Let's read it together. Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, the first point I'd make is that children of God finally go to heaven. This is the final resting place of the redeemed, both soul and that resurrected body. I mention that and emphasize that because some brethren don't believe it. I was listening to a brother pr preach at one of our college lectureships or a school lectureship a number of years ago, and he got up and said, I don't know whether we're going to heaven or not. And he read from Revelation 21, verse 2. John says, Now John saw the holy city in New Jerusalem descending down from, out of, uh, from God out of heaven. And of course he says, Now this is the dwelling place and this is the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And he said, I don't know whether we're going to heaven or not. He said, sounds to me like it's going to come down from heaven and we'll not be in heaven. That's something else. And then he proceeded to try to prove that we really weren't going to heaven. Well, I think that's a mistake. There are a number of ways we could look at this. For example, I go to Memphis to preach occasionally, and someone says, where were you? Well, I was preaching over at Memphis, but really I was preaching out at Raleigh or White Haven or South Haven or someplace like that. Well, you see, these cities grew out of Memphis, and they're really part of the metropolitan Memphis, the greater Memphis area. Uh, maybe, you know, Jesus said he went to prepare a place, and this place in Revelation 21 says, it's prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. That's one way of looking at it. But I think the clearest explanation is simply this. John was seeing a vision. This, that's what the book of Revelation is about. And God let this city down in order that John might see it and tell us about it. That may not be it, but it sounds very logical, very simple, in harmony with the text and what I understand of the Word of God. But now, will the children of God go to heaven? Well, the Bible says in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, pray and say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Now Jesus came, he was with God, and God's in heaven, and Jesus came from God, and he went back to be with the Father. John chapter 14, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. And God's in heaven, and he went back to heaven to prepare this place for us. And he says, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, there are a number of other passages along this line. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, two angels stood by the apostles. And they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing steadfastly into heaven? This same Jesus that's taken up from you into heaven. And it says three times in this verse, Why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus taken up from you into heaven shall so come again in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He said, You're looking into heaven, you saw Jesus go into heaven, and he's coming again from heaven. And he said in John 14, our text, that he'd take us back to be with him where his father is. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel of the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now this plainly tells me that Jesus is coming from heaven. He was with God in the beginning. He came down to be with us. He said, I'm going back to God. God's in heaven. The Bible clearly affirms this in so many passages. He's coming again. He's going to take us back up there. Why the evidence is conclusive and overwhelming. Children of God will dwell eternally in that home of the soul, that land of the redeemed for all the ages. And we call it, and the Bible calls it, heaven. Now, what's this heaven like? Let me say, first of all, and, and there's so much to say, let me say that heaven is a beautiful home. I've never seen people that didn't have some appreciation for beauty. Oh, they might be like I once was and thought I appreciated, I once thought only, I appreciated only functional things. Don't worry or bother me with, you know, these little frivolous pretty things. And then I learned as I grew a bit older that, that I had more appreciation for beauty than I thought I did. You're not surprised to go into homes of educated, affluent people and see marks of beauty and appreciation for beauty? But as children of God, you may be like Jesus and spend more time in the homes of the poor and the out of the way. And if you look, you'll notice I've never been in a home where I couldn't find some appreciation, some expression of appreciation for beauty. Might be nothing more than a goldenrod plucked from the wayside ditch and put into an old uh, broken glass or piece of fruit jar and sitting there as a bouquet. 
Might be a picture clip from a magazine, thumbtack to the wall. But there were appreciation, evidences of appreciation for beauty. I think this is merely a part of being made in the image of God. It's obvious our God loves beauty, and heaven is going to be a beautiful home. In the morning, in fact, yesterday morning when I awoke, I looked out my window to the green hillside that I expected to see, and it wasn't there. It was gone. God had painted it silver during the night. All of North Alabama, and I presume this area of Arkansas, was covered with a beautiful frost. And there was the silver glistening in the early rays of the rising sun. And I stood and looked at it and, and just admired it and appreciated it and drank in that beauty. A bit later, the sun arose and the warming rays of the sun melted the frost away. And it seemed that every leaf and every blade of grass shimmered with its own diamond, sparkling, radiant in the rising rays of the sun. I got into my car and started driving over here. I crossed the beautiful Tennessee River. I think it's the loveliest river valley in the world. Maybe that's one of the reasons I live over there. Maybe I'm prejudiced, and I'll admit that. I think it's the loveliest river valley I've ever seen. I looked down that beautiful stream of water, blue, green, shimmering in the morning sunlight. I looked at the bluffs and the hills, and I saw the colors of green and amber and gold. And I saw where the fall colors are beginning to flame red. And I began to think about that, and I thought, if God can make beauty like that in a world that's cursed in sin, what will he do in heaven? If he can make beauty like a sunset and, and moon glow and a tropical sea and, and the Colorado mountains and, and all of these lovely things, the Tennessee Valley and the White River Valley and, and the red buds bursting into blossom along these Arkansas Ark hillsides in the spring of the year, if he can make beauty like I used to see when I was a boy and look into the crystal depths of an Ozark spring and see a trout, you know, with his dorsal fins quivering in ten feet of crystal clear water, lie on the back and look at that blue sky and see a hawk making lazy circles in the sky, if God can do that in a world so cursed with sin, what would it be like in heaven? I really don't know. Except the Bible tells me it's a land of, of fountains. It's a fountain of life. And it's a land of rivers and trees. And the city itself is pierced gold. All the beautiful stones you can think about are beyond in heaven. Not long ago, in fact about three weeks ago, my wife and I were over in North England in evangelistic work. We taught during the day and I preached at night. When we closed the meeting on September the 8th, we drove down September the 9th to London to see one of our graduates there, Wayne Kilpatrick and his wife Brenda, are over there working in evangelistic work in England. We bought some books at a used bookstore there in London, and, and Wayne said, Brother Carl, I want you to go with me to the Tower of London, and I wanted to go. I'd heard so much of that bloody fortress, prison, palace. I wanted to see the room where Sir Walter Raleigh was kept prisoner for 14 years. I went into the room. I couldn't see that when it's closed now, called the Bloody Tower. Went into another, where Lady Jane Grey was kept. Really, I was in the room where her husband was kept and, and still engraved on the stones. He was only there a week, but he engraved on the stones on two sides of the walls of that prison, Jane. I believe he was either 18 or 19 years old and she was 17. They pointed out the window where she looked out the window and, and watched as they nailed her scaffold together. And the same day, she watched them take her husband out. She saw his headless body come back in the cart. And then they led her out to be executed as well. I wanted to go to that dreadful old place. We saw those things and thought about it and, and thought of the fleeting nature of power and, and how swiftly these kings are gone and they're nothing but dust and how much blood was shed there over their, their ambition and greed and avarice. And then we went down into one of the basement rooms or subterranean rooms and we went through a door that was at least 18 inches thick of stainless steel and into vaults where the crown jewels of England are kept. England has never been ravished by foreign power, and all the crown jewels are there, dating back to the 12th century, some of them maybe the 11th. And I never realized there was so much gold and silver and precious stones in all the world. And we stood there awestruck as we looked at wine coolers made of solid gold, hammered of solid gold, as big as this lectern. And there were gold and silver ceremonial swords and weapons of war, maces and billhooks and, and spears and things of this nature. And, and I saw pearls and diamonds, glittering stones and rubies and sapphires. And the crowns go back to about the 12th century, all the way up to the crown and the scepter of Queen Elizabeth II. And there's a stone, a diamond in the crown of Queen Elizabeth II that's, that's probably 
an inch long and, and maybe three quarters of an inch in diameter across the other way. And another stone, another diamond in her scepter, in the, in, in the handle of her scepter that's even bigger. It looked to me like it was more than an inch in diameter and maybe an inch and a half long. And I, I, I had no idea that there were diamonds that big. And I stood there and watched those diamonds reflecting the, the lights, and, and there, were, there was every color of the rainbow from those radiant gems. And we walked out, and I turned to one of the guards, and I said, what's the worth of those jewels? And he said, they're priceless. No worth can be placed upon them. No value can be placed upon them. Wayne and I walked on out in the sunlight, and Brenda and my wife May, and we walked along rather thoughtfully, not saying much for a little while, and I said, Wayne, there are two things I think of. Number one, the raggedest little boy in London is worth more than all those jewels. And I'd been preaching out to North England, and I saw 40 young people come out in a driving rainstorm Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Young people from about 12 to 18 years of age, and a sweet little girl named Deborah, about 11 or 12 years of age, sat on the front row, looked me right in the eye. Every time I'd preach, she was right there looking right at me in those deep brown eyes, and you could see the reflected intelligence there, and, and I marveled at the way all of them sang the, the little songs that they were singing together that appealed to young people. And I never did know Deborah's last name, but I, her, her eyes and her face rather haunt me because England is filled with children like that. So few people to go to tell the story. So little hope, so little opportunity for, for young people like this. And I got thinking about Deborah, and I thought Deborah is worth a million times more than all those crown jewels. And I reflected back to the children I saw in Thailand that don't even have that much hope. Children walking into the schools over in Bangkok with starched blouses and skirts and, and starched trousers, and I looked at, you know, looked at them closely, and somebody scrubbed their neck and ears and cut their hair cut so carefully, and, and you could tell that there was a daddy or a mother that loved those children and sent them out to learn. And 50% of them had never even heard the name of the Son of God. And I thought of that, but I thought of something else, getting back to our topic a little more closely. I thought of those radiant jewels, the like of which I'd never seen before. Brenda Kilpatrick said, Brother Carl, why did you think of that? And I said, Brenda, we're a long ways from Hopewell, Alabama, aren't we? That's our home. We kidded about it a little bit. But I tell you what, I, what occurred to me. If there's any glory and if there's any honor, then all those jewels are going to be in heaven. Listen to this statement in Revelation 21, 24. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. If there's anything glorious about those gems and about those jewels, they're going to be in heaven because the Bible says the glory and the honor of the kingdoms and the nations shall go into it. Now, I really don't know how much effect would that have. Would God go to the trouble? I, I doubt they'll be there, that God would go to the trouble to bring those trinkets over there. After all, what would a golden wine cooler the size of this pulpit, how much stir would it cause in heaven when the whole city is gone? The Bible says, and the city was of purest gold. Mere trinkets, just trinkets. But there's a beauty in music. I visited a brother's home the other day and he put on a record. A young lady was singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, and I was listening rather intently and suddenly a swelling chorus of voices arose behind and the chills chased one another down my spine, and I turned to him and I said, what was that? What is that? And he said, that's a 300-voice male chorus, 300 men singing the background to that beautiful old hymn. And I thought, how beautiful. And then I began reflecting on that, and I thought of Revelation 5, verse 9. The Bible says, they sung a new song, saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to thy God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and tribe and nation. And then he goes on to tell how the angelic host, and how the heavenly beings, and how all the creatures on earth and in earth and under the earth, and the whole universe joins together singing praise to God. What will it be like as we sing over in Alabama when all of God's singers get home? And then there's a beauty of purity. That was a long time, I guess, seeing this. 
really to know what I was seeing and thinking about. Next time you preachers are performing a wedding ceremony and it's some sweet young lady and some fine young couple in the congregation and you know they're pure-hearted and lovely and, and they've kept themselves for one another and they come to exchange their vows, look into the face of that bride and you get a little glimmering of, of this purity. My father and mother will have been married 65 years come February the 13th, 1975. I think I've seen a bit of pure love between them. Never, 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 ever heard my father say any impure thing in my life. But if you really want to see it, go down to the hospital. Get a pass to go up to the maternity ward and go down there and look into the faces of those babies. They're just shortly away from the hand of God. Purity. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What will it be like when we look on him who is altogether pure? And the pure in heart are those that are going to see God. And then there's a beauty of service that means so much. We honor our great heroes that gave their lives in service to humanity and to the country. We honor the men that died making possible cures for incurable diseases, and we honor the men who gave their lives in service to the nation. I was visiting in St. Paul's Cathedral and went down to see the tomb of Nelson and Wellington, Arthur, Duke of Wellington, who won the Battle of Waterloo. And Nelson, who defeated the French forces at Trafalgar a few years earlier and died in that battle, and I wanted to read the prayer that Lord Nelson wrote in his diary when he was in sight of the enemy and about to engage them in the fatal battle. He was one of my heroes. And nations honor their heroes because of their service. More than we do altogether too little in honoring our heroes of service. Altogether too little. But there's a great beauty and a loveliness in service. And, and May and I enjoyed so much our trip to England. And the thing that stands out most there is that we got to see H.B. and Laverne Frank. And some of you know them. Let me tell you something. If God has a hall of fame, if there's an aristocracy in the Church of Christ, H.B. and Laverne are in it. We'd heard of their service in France, in England. I knew that H.B. was a certified public accountant. I knew that he could be over here making a lot of money, living in a mansion, and maybe heading up his own company and so many things. And we went over there and found them living in what the English call a bungalow. We'd call it a duplex. And they were our host for the first part of our visit, uh, and hostess for the first part of our visit there. And you see, Laverne's in a wheelchair, and H.B. walks with his arms. And he's learned, you know, with braces and a lot of steel, and, and, and a lot of that steel is not only around his backbone, it's in his backbone. By that I mean he's, he's got that kind of grit and determination. And, and, he, and he walks, you know, on those canes with his arms. And I, I cried out in my heart. I wouldn't say anything to him. I, I've learned better than that after living, you know, a few years. But we'd be out knocking on doors, and, and it rained every day. We were up there in North England, and, and it was cold. And I, I'd look back. I, I'd start to run for the car, you know, to get out of the rain. And I'd look back, and here H.B. would be coming. And, and he'd just be smiling, you know, you know. And you never see him, and he isn't smiling. He'd just be smiling ear to ear. And, and I'd think, H.B., why don't you go back to America? God would understand, and, and let some of us that have got a good, strong body and two arms and two legs, and, and let us get some of the yellow out of our back and a little more grit and a little more steel in our back bones, and, and you go back over there, but I would have been wrong with you. You see, H.B. and Laverne have learned what Jesus meant when he said, He that will save his life will lose it, and he that will lose his life will save it. That's why Gus Nichols won't retire. And that's why George Benson's up here pleading for Zambia. They, they've learned something about the beauty of service. And oh, I, I watched H.B. And, and after about 24 hours over there, you forget all about the fact that, you know, that he walks, with, rides in a wheelchair, walks with his arms, and that Laverne's in a, in a wheelchair. You, you forget that, and pretty soon you just sit back, and they begin to wait on you, and, and then you have a lot better time, and, and that's exactly the way they want it. Because they're losing their lives that they might save it. And if you took H.B. Frank away from that which he loves, let me tell you, there's not enough money in this world, I don't believe, to get him to stop spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I'm not up here trying to elicit sympathy for him. You better congratulate him the next time you see him. He is a man who knocks on more doors than, than a great city of the preachers that I know anything about. I go out here and hold meetings all over the country, and I, I go to see local men that haven't had a cottage meeting in the last 60 days, and they're not expecting to have one the rest of the year. And they're not concerned about the loss, and if we go visit anybody, we go call on a few shut-ins if they have to know about someplace. Well, H.B. was out reading the law, knocking on doors. And Laverne and H.B. were well, Laverne and her children in that wheelchair. She was in the wheelchair, and the children helped her. And they put out 5,000 tracks. Or not tracks, but, but brochures advertising that meeting. Now, what does all this have to do with heaven? There's a beauty in service. If you live long enough and pray hard enough and work hard enough, you'll begin to see it. Uh, the, the, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen is a life molding itself in the likeness of the Son of God himself. David Underwood was talking to me about this situation. He said, you know, when I was a boy, I used to think that heaven was just going to be a, a big, long Sunday school picnic, that all we'd do, you know, would, would just be, you know, just lay around over there and, and smell the flowers. And he said, that doesn't appeal to me, and it doesn't appeal to young people. Listen to this reading. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3, his servants shall serve him. I don't know what we'll do, but we're going to serve him. This isn't very far afield. Brothers and sisters, do you believe there's a heaven? Do you want these young people to go to heaven? Do you know one of the reasons we can't recruit enough preachers even to fill our own pulpits? When the pioneers went out and established churches all over this land and, and uh, men have sacrificed and soldier boys have labored in, in their off-duty hours and, and their pulpits around the country and, and we can only find about seven or 8,000 men and we've got eighteen to 22,000 pulpits and then we talk about staffing those pulpits and training enough men for those pulpits. God forbid that we have such blindness. You know why we can't recruit them? We haven't helped young people see the beauty of service. You come through the country and blow a trumpet and say, young people, I'm challenging you to go out and die for a cause, and they'll flock to the standard. Then we saw them die in Germany, Korea, in Vietnam, and in some of the marches through Mississippi. When we start challenging our young people to go out and be ready to die for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll begin to recruit some young people to serve God. But until we begin to challenge them to serve and to be willing to die for Jesus, we will not do it, brethren. And I've, I've repeated my mistake. I'm recruiting young people to serve God. And I'm not telling them it's going to be easy. I'm telling them, get ready to go out and die for Christ. And after all, if he's not worth dying for, he's not worth living for. There's going to be service in heaven. We need to see that beauty of service. Final point I'd like for you to make. Next point I'd like to make is that heaven's our permanent home. We love things that are permanent. I think young people feel this. Maybe we, as we get older, we recognize that nothing's permanent. Our bodies decay, our homes decay. My father-in-law is in Florence. He's had a stroke last Friday. My wife told me about an hour ago that he's got pneumonia. He knows. His mind is very clear. But he's not afraid. He's learned that nothing here is permanent. You can look into those old brown eyes and he looks at you so steadily. He knows that he's, he's treading down that razor edge between life and death and he may go. But he's made his peace with God. He's looking for a permanent home. Now, He's a man that's lived 79 of his 81 years in Florence, Alabama. The only time he's ever gone was the two years he was in the service. Made one move in his life. He moved about 50 feet next door. Somebody asked him, said, Gene, why do you move so much? He said, it's just a gypsy in me. <laughs> now, here's a man, though, that's, that's learned that nothing's permanent. My family lost everything we had in the 30s. wasn't much, but we lost it all. Moved around a number of times the next few years for about five years, and maybe a little more. And then my dad got a few hundred dollars together, and he bought an old place up here in North Arkansas, bought 40 acres and an old tumble-down log house on it for $600. I've never moved any place in my life that gave me more thrill and comfort than that. We've been moving about every six months to a year, and my mother always loved flowers, and I helped her with the flowers, and 
And whenever she left any home, she left that thing covered up with flowers. And she taught me some things. She said, son, the house may not look like much, but she said, by the time we get through growing these flowers, nobody will see the house anyway. They'll just cover it up. Well, I wasn't interested in flowers because I knew we were going to move. I didn't want to plant a flower. Well, we moved to this little, old, you know, thin soil, rocky, and a little old tumble-down house. And we moved out there, and as soon as some of the tools arrived, I went around and got a hole and went outside the gate and started digging a hole. My mother said, son, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to plant a rose bush here. Well, she said, why? And I said, because I'm going to be here next year to smell it. I'll watch it bloom. I felt that we had some roots. We'd, we'd nail something down. Well, we didn't stay there long. Times got a little better, and there was 160 acres come, you know, up, and Dad bought that next door, and, and we moved into a little bit better, a little bit bigger type house. But, but nothing ever, ever encouraged me and thrilled me as much as moving into that one because, you see, at 12 years old, I hadn't learned how impermanent everything is in this life. But heaven is our permanent home. You know, the last time all the coils got together was 1936. I can barely remember it. We just can't seem to everybody get together. Several of them have gone on since then. Maybe your family is a little like that. And I, I used to miss them so much. I was the youngest, and I longed to see them, and I, and I loved those family reunions, and I could see all my brothers and my sisters and, and nieces and nephews and cousins and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and the partings came too frequently. But heaven's a permanent home. Never any separation. All our loved ones are going to be there. In John 14, the Bible says, Many mansions. One translation says abiding places, and the idea here in the Greek is uh, uh, of a continuing place. The same word is used in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, regarding Melchizedek, when it says concerning Melchizedek, he abideth a priest forever. And so heaven is our enduring permanent home. Now that old house where we lived is gone. It fell in and burned up, and you go back there, and the road is choked with brush and weeds, and you can hardly get there, and the well has gone, you know, it's been stopped up, and... And there's uh, persimmon bushes and blackjack bushes growing in the yard, and, and it's gone. But we're going to a land of fadeless day, to a city that hath foundations, where there will never be a separation, and there will never be a funeral wreath on the door, and a hearse will never roll down the street, and I'll never preach another funeral. Final point I'd like to make in this lesson this evening is that heaven holds all that the Christian loves the most. Everything we love should be over there. We're trying to send our treasure on ahead. We ought to be laboring night and day to take our friends and loved ones and acquaintances with us, and we ought to love the whole world like Jesus did. Our families ought to go there. We ought to be laboring to see that that's the case. But if your family doesn't go there, and some of these next things I'm going to say will have to do with that to try to help you see what I'm driving at, if your family doesn't go, remember, God is going to be there. And if you're a Christian, you love God more than anything else. I remember a few years ago when my wife and I were about to get mad and I thought we'd run into a difficulty that was insurmountable and unget overable and unget aroundable and it was a misunderstanding, it was all the world it was. But I remember how desolate I felt and I, I remember how, I guess the term's heartbroken, how distressed. But I remember thinking how grateful I was that God loved me. I hadn't been a Christian all that long then. I remember in my days when I claimed to be an atheist and was drinking on the south side of St. Louis and some things like that. And oh, I was so glad to be a child of God and I could call upon the Lord in prayer and that the Lord loved me and he'd redeemed me and that he'd never change. And let me tell you something, I love my wife and she loves me. But we're drawn closer together and bound closer together because each has a higher allegiance than to one another. Everything the Christian loves most is over there. I'm not sure that, that there's any way I can help you see, or that I can see these things. But I think I can talk more clearly about going home than I can about being home. I think I see a little bit more about what it's going to be like just to go than I do what it's like to be there. Indulge me just a moment. Suppose now that this old earth passes away. Maybe this building rends asunder and we see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory and the clouds are on fire and the trumpet blast sounds and we see the dead rising out of their graves and, and the righteous rising to meet Jesus in the air and, and then the world burns up and we stand before God in eternity and here's a mother standing there and she looks and sees her boy called up to be judged. And she remembers when she went down into death's dark valley to give that boy his life. 
She remembers how she literally knocked at death's door in order to, to bring him into the world. Boys, how many of us have lived to make a dirty, filthy joke out of motherhood? Hope you've repented of it. I did. Nonetheless, your mother risked her life in order to give you life. And she remembers. She sees that boy standing before the great white throne of God to be judged. She remembers how she told him the stories of, of Moses and Joseph and Daniel and Elijah and, and of Jesus and Paul and the others. And she remembers how she took him to Sunday school and she remembers how he grew to be a young man and maybe she lived to see him go away into the far country of sin. And she wept for the broken heart. And she wept many pillows with her tears at night as she prayed and cried and cried and prayed and begged God to bring that boy safely home. And then one evening, perhaps in an assembly like this, she saw him walk down an aisle. Sweet in his lips, confessed the grandest name this side of glory, and she beheld as some gospel minister buried him beneath the watery grave of baptism. And she beheld as he raised him up, born again of water and the Spirit, washed in the blood of the Lamb, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, washed free from all his sins, Revelation 22, or Acts 22, 16. She thought her heart would burst with joy. But then she lived to see that boy mold his life into the likeness of the Son of God. Maybe she even lived to hear him preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. But now comes the consummation of all her joy. She stands in the presence of God's holy angels. And there's an awestruck silence across all the dead buildings that have ever lived, now brought back to life before God. And she sees Jesus read from the book of life the name of her son. I expect to hear Jesus read from his book one day the name of Charles Coyle, Jr., and Charlotte Coyle, and Christopher Allen Coyle, and Carol Coyle, and my wife May. Oh, preacher, do you believe God knows our names? Why, well, he says he does. Says I know my sheep by name. Furthermore, he knows not further your name. Some people have said, oh, he's too busy to know, know our names. But well, the Bible says he knows how many hairs are on your head. Knows a lot more about you than the chief police does and than you know about yourself. Far more. Now, I want you men just to cut the cords of reality for a moment and let your mind flee away on the wings of fantasy. Search the realms of the universe and come back and tell me now what you think. Think with me for just a moment. Suppose you stand up there and you see your wife called up to be judged. You remember how you loved her in the days of youthful courtship? You remember you knew you loved her enough to die for her, but then the days came and went and you learned that the love you bore for her as a young man and, and in your courtship and early years was nothing to the love that, that grew there in your heart. You knew, as I know, every day that I'm away from home, my name is carried to the golden altar of Christian prayer. When I'm out in a gospel meeting, I always know that I get prayed for every day by my wife and children. And I know those people to whom I preach are prayed for every day because that's the kind of wife I have. I went over to marry her and was meeting the family, and her great aunt Florence pulled me aside and said, Son, come here. I went. She said, Sit down. I sat down. She said, let me tell you about the girl you're getting. And finally I looked. She was telling me, and I saw tears running down her wrinkled old cheeks, and she said, Mary's going to heaven. You know, I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Now I've watched her 30 years, and, and let me tell you, young men, something. When I was a teenager, I thought, you know, all the beauty of marriage was right up here on this honeymoon. It was downhill the rest of the way. I don't know where I got that idea, but it's wrong, stupid. Let me tell you, it just gets better all the time. Oh, you say, that's not, you, you're, you're talking about some kind of love that I, I'm talking about romantic love. What are you talking about? Let me tell you, when my wife comes into the room this day, my heart skips a beat and, and picks up. My pulse quickens a little bit. It's the kind of love I'm talking about. Well, I'm, I'm not blind. I can see that her hair is turning silver and the life lines are etched around her eyes. And I, I know she's growing older and I know that I am. But she's lovelier to me than she was the days I courted her here on the campus of Harding College. Now, what would it be like, you men, when you know that you've got a wife like that? And you stand up there before the great judgment of God, and she calls, she's called up to be judged, and you remember that she stood by you in every battle you ever fought for Christ. She partook of every joy and every sorrow and every sacrifice and everything you've ever done. She encouraged you to do it if it was good and righteous and noble. And you know that's the case, and you see her there to be judged. And you watch Jesus lean down and place that crown of victory upon her brow. Can you think of anything? Tell me now. Can you think of anything so lovely, so meaningful, so much to be desired as to stand in the presence of God's angels and watch your loved ones receive that crown of victory? 
If you want that to happen, then you better get right with God. The finest insurance you'll ever take out is to set them a Christian example. Oh yes, my wife's going to heaven, but it's a thousand times easier if I'll be faithful. I'm going to heaven, but I'll tell you it's far easier because she's a child of God and loves God and prays to God so much easier. What about you daddies, all of you children of God? What about you mothers, all of you been born again of water and the Spirit? How about you young people? Are there some young lads here that have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus? Your sins are upon your soul. The Bible says, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, Repent. You know what that means? That means to turn away from sin. That means to surrender to God. And so the Bible says, Turn away from sin. Surrender your life to God and be baptized. Every one of you. How many? Every one of you. How many was that, Lord? Doesn't that no, every one of you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you and your children and so on. And then there's some of you that have grown discouraged and you've slipped back. Your religion doesn't mean to you what it once did. I know I've been right through that. About a year ago, I had to walk down an aisle. I'd gotten so busy in administrative affairs, and I thought I was so tied up in things more important that I wasn't soul winning, and, and occasionally May would weep a little bit and say, we're, we're not soul winning like we once did. She said, I know the college is important, but we're, we're not soul winning. And she'd always gone with me. We'd always worked together. And finally, I began to see that if I was going to hit up a Bible, if I was going to have any part in it, and I was going to tell those young people, you can't graduate here unless you're a soul winner, then I better get out and get out of the south. And I had to make a public confession. I wanted my children to know I'd repented. And I wasn't going to stop soul winning until I died. I'm not saying you need to make a confession if you've neglected your soul winning. I'm not saying that. Maybe you can change right where you are. But I am saying this. Some of you have been discouraged and you've slipped back. And I know I've, my, I've enjoyed my service to Jesus a hundred times more since I did that. If you need Christ tonight, if you need to be restored, or if you need to be born again, let me add one more category. If any of you young men are here and you want to preach, you never have announced it or said it, but you know that you want to help people go to heaven. Sure, I believe it would be very much in order for them to come down and say, I wish these brethren pray for me because I want to preach the gospel of Jesus to the whole world.